Well, thank you, John. It's wonderful to be here in honor of a man, John Calvin, who wrote an enormously influential book. He did not go by what everyone was saying. He read what God's authors had written in the Bible. He instructed his flock to ignore much of the received theological and political wisdom of the time. Now, one joke I like concerns a speaker at a conference like this. Afterwards, he hears some criticism of his talk, and he gets a little depressed. But his kind host tells him, don't worry about it. He's the village idiot. He just repeats what everyone else is saying. I'd like to concentrate on some things Calvin taught about the Christian meaning of public life, things that contradicted what just about everyone else was saying. And to get into this, I'll start with something from my own life. As some of you know, I was a village idiot. I did not have the advantage of growing up in a Christian home and knowing from an early age, the basics of what is written and what is true. I grew up in a kind of Judaism that emphasized following old customs, not thinking about what is true. And during the 1960s, I gravitated to whatever seemed cool. I became an atheist. I participated in anti-war demonstrations at the time. I cared about the poor in an abstract way. And then I went further, joining the Communist Party in 1972. I studied Russian to speak with my Soviet big brothers. And that led to a situation in 1974 where I picked up a copy of the New Testament in Russian. I started reading it, or so I thought, just to improve my horrible Russian language skills. It was the only book in Russian I had in my room one night. And I had gotten it a couple of years before and just held on to it as a souvenir. I read very slowly, so it took me a while even to get to chapter 4 of Matthew. And that's where I read something striking. Satan, as you all know, tempts Jesus three times. And each time Jesus replies, it is written. And this interested me as a writer. Jesus cared enough about a book to emphasize its writing even when offered magnificent prizes if he would act according to what he had just heard. Now, up to that time I had heard two variants of what passed as Christian teaching and practice. Growing up in the Boston area, I had heard Roman Catholics purportedly taking care of their sin by repeating Hail Marys. And then at college in New Haven, I heard William Sloan Coffin, a famous liberal Protestant preacher at the time, criticizing the war in Vietnam. And so I associated Protestantism with anti-war demonstrations. But here Jesus was saying something radically different. It is written. Eventually, purely through God's grace, I certainly wasn't seeking, I was completely lost. Purely through God's grace, I gained some faith in him. In 1976, I joined a church. 1976 was the year of an evangelistic campaign in which people were wearing buttons and putting on bumper stickers saying, I found it. So that's what I heard. People saying, I found it. But in 1977, a reformed pastor, in essence, told me that what I had heard was theologically incorrect. Now, I knew from my own personal experience that I had not found it, since God in his mercy had drawn me. But the little theology I knew, only later did I know that there was a difference, say, between, uh, between an Arminian and an Armenian. Uh, <laughs> only later did I start to understand what is written in the Bible. This pastor, a fellow named Ed Steele in Indianapolis, took me through Romans over several days of tutoring. And then he bought me two volumes, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. 
And Calvin explained, it is written. And that's what he taught. And this is remarkable. Five centuries ago, just everybody, just about everybody, went by what was heard. Ordinary people in Europe, with the exception of Jews, and there's nothing about Jewish history that's ordinary, ordinary people were illiterate. And the Catholic Church viewed this not as a minus, but as a plus. The view was that if people read the Bible for themselves, they would become confused. So they should merely listen to their priest and do what the priest said. And more recently, a fellow named John Piper, you may have heard of him, wrote about William Tyndale's contribution and Thomas More's attacks on Tyndale. And John Piper wrote this, Thomas More's criticism of Tyndale boils down mainly to the way Tyndale translated five words. He translated presbyteros as elder instead of priest. He translated ecclesia as congregation instead of church, and so on. Now, John Calvin did something similar in his institutes and his other writing, not by translating, but by exegeting. He brought back the Christian meaning of public life after the medieval church had essentially stripped it of that meaning, stripped Christianity of that meaning, and the Catholic Church had said essentially that only ecclesiastical life is significant. And Calvin particularly changed thinking about the role of Christians in government and in entrepreneurial activity. And other people, I think, are much better able to talk about the way Calvin changed church life. I'll talk a little bit here about how he changed thinking, how he changed the conventional wisdom about life in politics and government and life in business and economics. So first, about Christians in government. And I'll mention about five points. Tyndale, five words. I'll give five points in each of these areas. So Christians in government. First, many Christians throughout medieval times had heard that work in a church or life in a monastery was the best way, and in fact, the only way to follow God's will. The theater of God, in short, was not the whole world, but only the parts of it where priests remove themselves from the world. But Calvin wrote in his Institutes, this is book 4, chapter 20, that I'm quoting here, no one ought to doubt that civil authority is a calling, not only holy and lawful before God, but also the most sacred and by far the most honorable of all callings in the whole life of mortal men, end quote. And it's thinking like that that led many of the founders of the American Republic to enter politics, not thinking of it as a second-class activity, but actually, in Calvin's own estimation, a first-class activity. And second, many Christians throughout medieval times had heard that they should not go to court under any circumstances. And one result of that was that the weak had little redress against the powerful. Submission to church and state authority was a Christian duty, no questions asked. Any talk back in court or otherwise was a rebellion against God. But Calvin wrote, quote, As for those who strictly condemn all legal contentions, let them realize that they therewith repudiate God's holy ordinance and one of the class of gifts that can be clean to the clean. The Christian endures insults, but with amity and equity defends the public interest. He will use the help of the magistrate in preserving his own possessions." End quote. And such thinkings led the founders of our republic to push for a government of laws, not of men, and to assure that there could be an opportunity for legal redress of grievances. Third, 
many Christians throughout medieval times had heard that rulers or magistrates could do virtually whatever they wanted. The powerful were bound only by their own power, and their edicts were not to be challenged by Scripture. Calvin, though, wrote that, quote, kings should not multiply horses for themselves, nor set their mind upon avarice. Princes should remember that their revenues are not so much their private chests as the treasuries of the entire people, which cannot be squandered or despoiled without manifest injustice. And Calvin argued, if, and note by the way the if, if kings want to be considered legitimate and as servants of God, they need to show that they are real fathers to their nation. End quote. Thinking of that sort, let, let Americans in the 1760s and the 1770s to argue that taxation without representation was tyranny because they had a right to decide how their taxes should be levied and spent. Fourth, Christians throughout medieval times had almost never been able to vote for their leaders. But when Calvin was exegeting Deuteronomy, chapter 1, he stated that, quote, those who were to preside in judgment were not appointed only by the will of Moses, but elected by the votes of the people. This is the most desirable kind of liberty, that we should not be compelled to obey every person who may be tyrannically put over our heads, but which allows of election, so that no one should rule except he be approved by us. And this is further confirmed in the next verse, wherein Moses recounts that he awaited the consent of the people and that nothing was attempted which did not please them all, End quote. And Calvin also argued in his commentary on Micah that, quote, it is the best condition of the people when they can choose by common consent their own shepherds. When men become kings by hereditary right, it is not consistent with liberty, End quote. In commenting on Acts, Calvin wrote that, quote, it is tyrannical. If any one man appoint or make ministers at his pleasure, end quote. Now this today may seem to us like, well, old stuff, we know that. We have elections, we've had elections for centuries. This was radical stuff five centuries ago. And there was such thinking in the 18th century that again led the American founders to establish a republic they knew that given the sinful natures we all have, few kings could resist robbing and even killing to get what they wanted. But before they could establish freedom to choose, the founders did have a problem. What loyalty did they owe to the king? And that question leads to my fifth and final point in this section, Many Christians throughout medieval times had heard that it would be unbiblical to rebel against those said to live by divine right. But John Calvin, while arguing against private individuals taking the law into their own hands, wrote about magistrates of the people appointed to restrain the willfulness of, willfulness of kings. He wrote that these lesser magistrates must not, quote, wink at kings who violently fall upon and assault the lowly common folk, end quote. And Calvin, in fact, wrote that a refusal to oppose monarchs in such situations when they were oppressing the lowly common folk. Refusal to oppose them is, quote, nefarious, perfidy because they dishonestly betray the freedom of the people of which they know that they have been appointed protectors by God's ordinance, end quote. 
Now let me note that Calvin in his writing did not stretch out that doctrine. His most notable defensive rebellion concerned one of the greatest aggressions in history, the order and exodus of the Pharaoh that all Hebrew babies be killed. Calvin in his commentary on Exodus defended the Hebrew midwives who disobeyed. He wrote that obedience to the monarch in that that situation was preposterously unwise. He argued that those who obeyed in that situation were attempting to gratify the transitory kings of earth while taking no account of God. So Calvin largely defended rebellion only to preserve life. His disciples went a little further although starting again from that idea of defending life and in the face of a murderous monarch. uh, Catholic aggression had its major 16th century manifestation in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France. Beginning on August 23rd, 1572, ending with the murder by government decree of anywhere from 5,000 to 60,000 Huguenots, the French Protestants. There are estimates very widely but it was clearly a tragedy that required some additional thinking on the basis of the points that Calvin had laid down. It precipitated new declarations of the right to oppose kings. One disciple of Calvin in 1579 wrote a book of Vindicie contra Tyrannos, Vindication Against Tyrants, which contended that even military revolt might be necessary to defend God's law against kings who gave orders contrary to it, orders that would take life, orders that would seize property, orders that would remove liberty from people. And this was a a huge development. The author of Indicia argued that fundamental law comes from God. So obeying the law means obeying God, not necessarily the state. Rebellion against an unlawful state act led by lesser magistrates such as local leaders was thus a justifiable maintenance of true law. And as you can imagine, those who were in power did not relinquish, did not did not readily relinquish medieval thinking. In England, for example, even a diminishing of royal authority did not quickly bring about freedom. English lawyers joked that Parliament can do everything except making a woman a man or a man a woman. Today's Parliament in London would probably say it can do that as well. But as generation after generation of Calvinists read Vindicier or other works that emphasized the limitations of power, the idea of government almost God diminished. And I won't trace here the whole development from the 16th through the 18th centuries. Uh, David Hall does a good job of that in a book of his called Calvin in the Public Square. There were many contributors throughout the decades, including people like Christopher Goodman and John Knox, of course, Samuel Rutherford. And the list continues to Samuel Adams, who in 1743 defended his Harvard thesis that resistance to the Supreme Magistrate was lawful if the commonwealth cannot otherwise be be preserved. And John Adams and lots of others wrote how Calvin's doctrines greatly influenced Americans of the 1760s and the 1770s as they first became aware that they were Americans and not just British subjects. So, to sum up Calvin's thinking in the area of government and politics, sin is always with us, But work in politics and law can sometimes glorify God. Monarchies can and probably will be ungodly. Republics, there's plenty of sin to go around in them as well, but they're probably going to be better. Since both rulers and ruled are sinners, limited government is the best help to both. And when leaders try to be dictators, Lesser magistrates, when a tipping point arises, can be righteously rebellious. Again, this may be old stuff to some of us now, but it was revolutionary five centuries ago. Highly creative, highly different 
from what people had heard for centuries. Now let me turn to five points about Christians as entrepreneurs, what Christian economics looks like, what that type of aspect of the public square should be. Now, Christians previously had heard a lot of things about work and economics. But Calvin emphasized that all honest labor, not just that within churches and monasteries, glorifies God. People who were engaged in ordinary life were not ordinary. Theirs was not a second-class existence. Calvin emphasized taking dominion over all creation and not just the ecclesiastical acreage. In a sermon on chapter 3 of Matthew, Calvin envisioned God as, quote, beckoning with his finger and saying to each and every individual, I want you to live this way or that. Each and every person, not just priests, has a God-given vocation that, quote, is good and profitable for the common good, end quote. So work itself, not a curse. Work with thorns and thistles, part of the curse, but work itself is valuable. No work done to God is secular. So the divide that was common in medieval days, and even today we sometimes hear a little about it a little bit when, we, when people talk about full-time Christian service as opposed to working, let's say, in a business or organization of some kind that isn't part of the church or part of missionary activity. Calvin saw all service to God as full-time Christian service. Secondly, Christians throughout medieval times had heard that the way to get closer to God was through some added-on discipline, such as penance or fasting or forms of self-flagellation. Calvin wrote that God did not require such celebrations of discipline, especially when it took productive discipline for Christians to earn their daily bread and to help others. Calvin knew that requiring what could be called hard practice beyond the hardness of life itself could lead to harmful pride and a wasting of talents. I use this, these two words, hard practice, not because Calvin used them, but because I spent some time a few years back visiting, observing, learning about, learning from Japanese Buddhists who immersed themselves in freezing mountain streams or sat for hours in the lotus position without moving until their legs cramped up and they could hardly walk. I remember one woman in her 40s, early 40s, who had lived a hard life with abandonment by her parents and then by her husband. She had one child. When he was a toddler, she began going to a Shingon Buddhist temple on Mount Koyasan and engaging in the hard practice of standing in a freezing mountain stream. But it struck me that taking care of a small child is hard practice in itself. And Calvin, in essence, asked the question, why substitute unproductive and unnecessary hard practice for productive hard practice? Calvin showed us that the real way to get closer to God is to do what God has made us to do. If I say hey, I I want to go to Chicago this evening and this is a a bad podium because it doesn't have an engine and seats that will get me there. I'm obviously misunderstanding the purpose of a podium. Calvin linked anthropology and teleology. He wrote in his commentary on chapter 2 of Genesis, quote, men were created to employ themselves in some work not to lie down in inactivity and idleness. When God ordained that men should be exercised in the culture of the ground, he condemned in his own person all indolent response. Nothing is more contrary to the order of nature than to consume life in eating, 
drinking, and sleeping, end quote. So God, in short, makes us to work. And commenting on Deuteronomy 24, Calvin argued that any removal of work throws human life into ruin. And think about it. Today, many people retire while still in very good health, and they often find out that that throws human life into ruin. Calvin, with many kinds of health problems, wrote and preached until literally the day he died. He proposed and modeled in his life the discipline of work in a calling and the discipline of service, particularly to the poor. His hard practice emphasized the discipline of getting up early and working throughout the day with frequent preaching and an absolutely astounding output of writing in those days when the cutting edge of word processing was a quill pen. Third, Calvin's stress on the importance of work led him to promote vastly improved Christian understanding of what can be and should be achieved through business. In my sense, and this is trying to develop some of Calvin's thought, and so I just throw this out as something to think about, we can almost talk about five levels of understanding what Christians should do when working in a business. Level one is what some Christians back 500 years ago and now have grudgingly believed, well, work gets us our daily bread, but it has little value beyond that. And then there's level two, which grudgingly supports work because you can acquire cash in that way for your daily bread, but also you can go, so you can go use that money to support ministries and missions. Again, that's the full-time Christian service, and you can support it by your earnings. So you grudgingly work to support your family and to provide for those involved in full-time Christian service. And then a level three support of work is also semi-grudging. A job supports a family and ministries, but also it allows you in the workplace to witness to co-workers, and that's a very positive thing. But the work itself is something that's a means to an end and not really any kind of end in itself. Now, Calvin does not neglect those pragmatic uses of work. They're all valuable. He adds one more, which we could call in a sense level four, stewardship that improves what we are given and creates multi-generational wealth. In discussing Genesis, Calvin advised his readers, quote, let him who possesses a field so partake of its, year, of its yearly fruits that he may not suffer the ground to be injured by his negligence, but let him endeavor to hand it down to posterity as he received it or even better cultivated, end quote. But then I think there's also a level five, Building a business is more than a means to an end. Americans employed outside their home typically spend more of our active time at places of work than anywhere else. And those places can be where individuals gain more dignity, where individuals grasp freedom, employ creativity. They can also be domains of forced labor without joy. But if that's the case, then work breeds elder brothers, if we play off the parable of the, of the prodigal son. And the elder brothers associate work as just drudgery, lack of creativity, stuff they have to do, and they resent what only seems like obligation. And then if the younger brothers see that in the elders, see what, they, what looks like slavish conformity, no fun, then they will often run away. And that, by the way, is the reason why the 1950s in the U.S. mutated into 1960s culture. Elder brothers breed young, younger brothers. But I digress. Uh, back to Calvin and a fourth point related to economics. He understood that building businesses and work opportunity requires the proper use of credit and that the medieval church's interpretation of usury was wrong. Christians throughout medieval times had heard that they should not make loans involving the charging of interest. And as a result, Christians made very few business loans. Jews made loans and became the objects of envy and popular rage. Calvin, though, pointed to what is written. 
He argued that biblical opposition to usury was not to all interest-bearing loans, but to those that took advantage of the poor. He understood that loans to grow a a business were different than loans to a starving man. He understood that charging interest on the former was legitimate and necessary business activity. He understood that if you ban interest in regular economic activity, then you reduce opportunities to promote human flourishing. So Calvin's defense of interest was very important in his day. And you might think, well, we all know that now. We pay interest, at least on our credit card. And maybe that's unchallenged now, but Muslim influence on Sharia law that purportedly bans interest, although there are various ways of getting around that, make Calvin's arguments very topical once again. And fifth, many people throughout medieval times had heard that the best way to help the poor was to give them spare food, spare clothes, spare coins, helping them materially. Now, Tyndale's emphasis, as John Piper points out, Tyndale's emphasis on agape, on love, was important. Love more important than just the charitable giving away of material. Time, as important and sometimes more important than love. And Calvin's theoretical writing, plus the policies he implemented in Geneva, showed in practice the meaning of agape. Calvin taught and showed that the best way to tackle poverty was not to distribute alms, but to open a business and employ those who would otherwise beg. And let me just mention the issue of World Magazine that went to press yesterday uh, has a cover uh, with a headline, Trade, Not Aid, in relation to helping people in Africa and other poor countries. And that is really the same type of thing that Calvin was talking about. The understanding underlying Calvin's emphasis on helping the poor and the alien was simple. Everyone is created in God's image and worthy of respect. And Calvin wrote, and let me just mention this in terms of all the discussion and debate concerning immigration these days. Calvin wrote, quote, We cannot but behold our own face, as it were, in a glass, in the person that is poor and despised, though he were the furthest stranger in the world. Let a more or a barbarian come among us, and we will see that he is our brother and neighbor. End quote. This formula was not hard. God creates, man respects. Over time, though, some Christians in medieval times stopped fighting poverty and began to see it as a road to holiness. They leaped from the biblical argument that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil to a belief that money and material things by themselves are evil. They took vows of poverty and went begging from city to city, thinking that this would draw them and the almsgivers closer to God. Shortly before John Calvin's birth, a French bishop invited beggars from all over Europe to come to the city of Lyon so church members could more readily win salvation by giving them charity. And soon local resources were overtaxed and people were dying in the streets. The church leaders had to call the whole thing off. But Calvin favored neither hair shirts nor indulgent charity. He showed that voluntary poverty arose within a wrong-headed salvation by works mentality. Now, the Catholic Church in medieval times sometimes romanticized poverty. The same condescending error occurs today. But Calvin, in his book, his commentary in the book of Amos, noted that poverty does not make people godly. It may even make them more susceptible to Satan's snares. And let me quote here, when men are pressed by famine they would sooner sell their lives a hundred times that they may save themselves from hunger, no matter what the price, end quote. So Calvin essentially emphasized 
learning, developing, helping people gain a trade rather than just providing aid. Instead of emphasizing the transfer of food, Calvin encouraged new businesses, particularly in those days weaving. He taught that all vocations, except those forbidden by God, such as assassins for hire, all vocations are good. Geneva's war on poverty mirrored Calvin's emphasis on productive hard practice. Just quickly to go through the particular uh, way they had of organizing things, the city of 12,000 had 28 districts, each with a population of about 425. A district supervisor screened all requests for aid presented to the deacons, those that deserved approval. And deacons visited homes to verify needs. About 5% of Geneva's population received financial help almost always short term. And deacons, thinking entrepreneurially, sometimes used church funds to pay for tools or raw materials or the initial rent on a shop so refugees who were craftsmen could get to work. So to sum up the points in this section, all honest labor, not just church work, is good. Self-flagellation is bad. We don't need to make life harder than it is. Hard work is good. Interest-bearing loans that help business to expand and provide more work are good. The poor should work rather than beg, receiving startup help as needed. No help should be given to the able but lazy. Help should be reserved for those truly in need who cannot help themselves. And this was Calvin's model. And social Calvinism became the American way until social Darwinism and social universalism arose in the late 19th century. And I wrote about this in a book called The Tragedy of American Compassion. Social Calvinism worked wonderfully in America in helping generations come out of poverty. Social Calvinism even helped my own grandparents, Jewish immigrants from the Russian Empire, who came to New York and Boston a century ago. And that helped them out of poverty. So, paying attention, I think, is an important part of what Calvin taught. Paying attention to what is written, paying attention to the world around us, observing. I've written about how Calvinistic thought was the beginning of modern journalism. Paying attention to things. And I want to emphasize, as I come to a conclusion, the fundamental way in which Calvin undercut what Christians had heard from centuries of priests. He told all of his followers that they were in the theater of God. He instructed all of his followers to pay attention to the events around them. Again, the theater was not the monastery. The theater was not the church building. The theater was all around us. Jesus told his disciples, look at the birds of the air. But if you look at the medieval church, what it paid attention to, at least in much of the artwork of the time, the artists did not look at the birds of the air. They didn't try to draw them realistically. And they really didn't help others to look. There are exceptions. But they had a reason for not looking. Realism was virtually heresy. It was no accident nor lack of knowledge of how to use perspective in drawing that led to generic figures floating off the earth in medieval artwork. The overall goal was to separate from this world. So artists depicted separated saints. But Calvin's emphasis on providence meant that daily events gave us some indication of God's mind at work and at play. Calvin wrote, quote, if God does nothing random, there must always be something to learn, end quote. Wanting to learn, considering the world important, Calvinists founded newspapers and colleges and conducted scientific experiments.
Calvinistic mindfulness included paying attention to the surrounding languages. Christian intellectuals had heard for centuries that they should write in Latin. But Calvin wrote in French as well. He preached in a way accessible to the broad public, not just scholars. His sentences were short and clear. This was a change so remarkable, a change from the lugubrious prose of the time, that historians of language see Calvin as the creator of modern French sentence structure. Christians throughout medieval times had heard that they were holier if they abstained from all material pleasures. Calvin, though, wrote that God, quote, meant not only to provide for necessity, but also for delight and good cheer. Has the Lord clothed the flowers with the great beauty that greets our eyes, the sweetness of smell that is wafted upon our nostrils? And yet, will it be unlawful for our eyes to be affected by that beauty or our sense of smell by that sweetness of odor? So Calvin opposed any doctrine that, quote, deprives us of the lawful fruit of God's benevolence. Calvin was a fallen sinner, as all of us are. He clearly had his weaknesses, but those weaknesses often grew out of strengths. Libertines have have attacked him for centuries, so have libertarians, who criticize regulations that the Geneva City Council, sometimes at odds with Calvin, but often under his tutelage, passed during especially the last decade of Calvin's life. For example, starting in 1558, dinners in Geneva of all kinds were to include no more than three courses, each course having a maximum of four different dishes. Starting in 1560, the wearing of gold or silver necklaces or other jewelry was also forbidden. Now, Calvin supported such restrictions and may have proposed some. His reasons were public-spirited. He wanted native Genevans to spend less money on themselves and provide more help to the poor refugees who flooded into Switzerland as France persecuted Protestants and eventually outnumbered the native Genevans. Calvin reacted as many, as many American Christians would now if the U.S. had over 300 million immigrants living in great poverty while the owners of Park Avenue penthouses regularly put on parties for pooches. And furthermore, Calvin had seen the affluent sometimes strip the indebted poor of their furniture and even their clothes. He could not stomach grand parties and rich clothes amid poverty. He wrote, quote, Christ was not a tailor, end quote. He didn't believe in that. When others were starving and dressed in rags, he wanted the rich to dress simply and spend the money they saved on new businesses that would employ the poor. But Calvin, I think, pressed that point too hard because such changes needed to come through changed hearts, not through legislation or regulation. Attempts to force compassion foster resentment. So with all the strengths and and strengths growing out of the experiences Calvin had, and some weaknesses, as we can now see with 2020 retrospective vision, sometimes growing out of the strengths. We can learn from all the Calvin positives and also some of the resentment that came about. You know, Calvin himself knew the limitations of power. He wrote in his commentary on John that, quote, the kingdom of Christ being spiritual must be founded on the doctrine and power of the spirit. In the same manner, its edification is promoted. For neither the laws and edicts of men nor their punishments inflicted by them enter into the consciences, end quote. So I think sometimes in America now we have a tendency to look at laws and put our hope in laws. We, for example, um, look at the, the terror of abortion and sometimes say, well, if only the Supreme Court were to overthrow Roe v. Wade, if only we'd have a constitutional amendment, if only we'd have this. And that would help. I'm all in favor of that. But I think we can see from experiences throughout the centuries, Calvin's in our own, that it is the consciences that need to be changed. And that then leads to different laws. And let me just point out, as far as abortion is concerned, the compassion offered to women facing crisis pregnancies 
back in the 19th century, reduced the abortion rate by a lot, and in recent years has also reduced the abortion rate. So it's those compassionate alternatives that I'm sure many of you are engaged in, in your own cities, that makes a huge difference. And that's another thing that we can learn from Calvin's emphasis on the conscience and on compassion. And when Calvin sometimes, in his eagerness, his desire, went past that and working with the city council in Geneva, passed certain edicts that often backfired. And it certainly led to some of the uh, historical backbiting against Calvin. And Calvin himself attacked, quote, perilous and seditious notions, end quote, that modern states must adopt the political system of Moses. He wrote that everyone should follow God's moral law, but, quote, constitutions have certain circumstances under which they in part depend. It therefore does not matter that they are different, provided all equally press toward the same goal of equity, end quote. He wrote that, quote, the statement of some that the law of God given through Moses is dishonored when it is abrogated and new laws referred to it as utterly vain, end quote. So he understood the importance of freedom. He understood the importance of liberty. He understood the importance of different cultures having rules and customs and laws that respect the historical experience of those cultures, all within the framework of what is written in the Bible and what God teaches us. And so here we see in Calvin's stress on particular points, but also his willingness to allow some variety and, in fact, advocate that. We see Calvin's fundamental understanding of secular scripts within the theater of God. He knew that a stimulating theater stages a variety of dramas, and many are tragedies. He allowed room for cultural differences that laws would reflect. He wrote, quote, how malicious and hateful toward public welfare would a man be who was offended by such diversity, end quote. He demanded only that the state allow persons to worship God and not violate, quote, that conscience which God has engraved upon the minds of men, end quote. So here we see the contributions of Calvin concerning the theater of God and public activities within them. A different understanding of the role of government in politics, a different understanding of business and economics, a different understanding of how individuals should live and what is the proper way, the proper ways to glorify God in a variety of endeavors and callings. Now, today, surrounded by media cacophony, we hear all kinds of things, and we all have a tendency to repeat what others say. We have a president and other politicians who go around talking up vain imaginings. But this country would be stronger and better, and other countries would be as well, if we all paused to look at and study what is written. What is written in the Bible? In this country, what is written in a constitution grounded in biblical thinking? What is written in the books, wonderfully and amazingly written by the Bible's finest interpreter, John Calvin? Our national leaders and we ourselves should all pay attention to Calvin's admonition that leaders, quote, are ordained protectors and vindicators of public innocence. Their sole endeavor should be to provide for the common safety and peace of all. Thank you very much.